Well, it's really good to be here with you today. It's summer. I'm excited to be in short sleeves, untucked today. It's a good day for me. Excited to be with you. Daniel is sweltering over in the other end in his coat, uh, but that's okay. It's good for him, but it's good to be here. Good for Craig. Thank you for leading us. Daniel and Craig doing a great job leading over here. I'm excited to be with you in the gathering this morning. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 6 as we continue our behind-the-scenes study in the book of Luke. I had a friend in college that if we were to go out to eat, he would, uh, we'd be sitting somewhere, and if he could find a place in a restaurant where he could kind of go around a corner where there were some people who couldn't see us sitting there, he would walk over there, and he would just start to get people's order. He would water, tea, drinks, whatever, food, he would just get, and then, and then just go sit down, or he'd go over to another table and act like he was the manager, everything doing okay over there. He had no authority, but he was, he was pretending. I heard a story recently about a group out of uh, uh, Ireland. They were traveling, and they were going through customs, and uh, the rugby team was there, and they were needed to get to their uh, game, match, whatever rugby people play, and there were no customs officers available. And so they just started to put, they put on the hat, they put on the uniform, and they just started checking people through. No telling what happened when the actual authorities arrived, but they had no authority. Well, in our text today, that's how people are going to view Jesus. That's how the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are going to view Jesus. Who, who is this guy? And, and what are you about? And, and what are you doing? And, and, and why, why are you doing it? You, you don't have that kind of authority. That's not who, who you are. That's not who we believe God is. That's not who we believe the Messiah will be. Jesus was not a Pharisee. He had no formal religious training like the religious leaders and priests in that day. So who is he? to do what he's going to do in our text this morning. So there's going to be some controversy here. There's going to be some drama. Jesus is going to act in a very uh, provocative way uh, towards uh, the Pharisees and towards the religious leaders. Now, in in Jesus' day, the Jewish people had a lot of laws. They were under Roman law, which had a lot of laws. Uh, They followed the Torah and the 613 commandments that were uh, there, uh, and as they understood the tor- Torah and the Hebrew Bible, how, how they uh, were to live their life based on those 613 commandments, they also had a whole other set of concoctions that they had developed of ways and what it meant to be uh, following the law that God wanted them uh, to follow. Uh, they were great, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, were great rule makers, and they tried to keep the rule. And so one of the things that's really important to them, one of the biggest rules was honoring and keeping the Sabbath. It was a a, a distinguishing mark for the Jewish people, and so Sabbath-keeping was really important. So with all that in mind, let's take a look. Luke chapter 6, we'll look at verse 1. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, Why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so, and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. So this text occurs in a series of mounting questions that Jesus is facing. He's been healing. He's been eating with sinners. He's been questioned about fasting And now he's being questioned about Sabbath observance. First, his disciples, his followers, they were reaping, they were threshing, they were preparing food all on a holy day of rest as they were going through a field. 
So Jesus makes a note to point out that someone that they esteemed highly, King David, King David would have been well respected by the Pharisees. He entered the house of God. He ate the bread that was consecrated uh, for the priest to eat. But ultimately that bread symbolized God's presence and God's fellowship with his people. And so Jesus is pointing out, hey, King David, this person that you really look up to, he put human need over ritual law. And so when Jesus says the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath, the Sabbath, again, one of the primary markers of what it meant to be Jewish, the bottom line here isn't should we or should we, or should we not observe the Sabbath. That's not what Luke's trying to get at. The question Luke's really trying to get at is, is who's the identity of Jesus? And does Jesus have this kind of authority? Because what we know from, from reading Luke is that, that Jesus does have that kind of authority. He's the one who, who God would prove in due course to be the rightful Messiah, the rightful king of Israel. And that means that Jesus is the rightful king over the Sabbath. That means that such authority makes the law. It cannot be accused of breaking the law because Jesus is the one that has the authority to make the law. And so verse 6 carries that forward when Jesus is in the synagogue. And he, here he is, he's the visiting teacher, and he sees a person in need. And, and this time it's a man with a, a shriveled hand. Now, a shriveled hand would have been an injury that prevented a man from, from having a job, more than likely. Um, but the man was not in mortal danger, and that's a, a clear distinction. The man's limited in what he can do, but he's not in mortal danger. And mortal danger meant that there could be a healing, something done about that on the Sabbath. But what the text tells us in verse 7 is that they were, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were, they were watching. And that word for watch uh, carries, carries with it kind of a, a suspecting eye. Like you're just, you suspect something and you're watching because you're fully expecting that what you're watching is going to step out of bounds and, and you're going to say something. Suspecting I, very suspicious, uh, waiting. They were just waiting for Jesus to make a mistake. And so in their mind, that distinction, remember about the man with the, the shriveled hand, he's not in mortal danger. So in their mind, this can wait. It doesn't need to be done on Sabbath. That's not the time and the place. It, it can be done after Sabbath, but it's not going to be done on Sabbath. That's a, a clear violation. And so Jesus poses a question in verse 9. He said, I ask you, he puts it back on them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He, he asks in such a way that suggesting that, that a failure to act would be doing evil. And the action becomes a test. Will the Son of Man, will God allow a healing to take place on the Sabbath. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the Sabbath. The Sabbath was more than just rolling out of bed, uh, dressing decently or a little more decently than maybe we do the rest of the week and uh, going to, to, to Bible study and to worship and then getting to eat brunch or, or a lunch and, and maybe a good nap, maybe something on TV and then getting ready for the rest of the week. And that's not how Sabbath was observed in Jewish culture. The Sabbath was Sundown Friday, sundown Saturday. And within the Sabbath, remember I talked about a whole set of laws. Not only were there the 613 laws in the Torah that the, the Jewish people wanted to follow, but there were at least 39 different categories of prohibited behavior on the Sabbath alone. That's stressful, trying to make sure you don't break a rule on the Sabbath. Because intentionally breaking a Sabbath law was punishable up to death. And so just to be on the safe side, they had all kinds of rules. Just to be on the safe side, let's not maybe perhaps let this thing lead to work. So you wouldn't even touch an object that might be permissible for work any other day of the week. You wouldn't want to touch a pencil, a hammer, money, whatever kind of tool of the day it was, because you might forget that it was the Sabbath and you might start working. Sounds kind of good to me some days, but... It was all designed so that you didn't do anything to break the Sabbath law. When I was a, a boy, the first five years of my life, we lived 
in West Kama, Texas. It's north of Waco, about 30 miles. Dad pastored the First Baptist Church of West. And our family lived at that time in a parsonage, which was a, a church uh, paid for by the house. And that's where our family lived. And it was right next door to the church. And so one Sunday, I had my toy lawnmower outside on a Sunday, and I was told, don't do that because people might think that you are allowed to work on the Sabbath. I mean, we still have this kind of spirit in some places. Some people believe that even having a, a splinter under your fingernail was, was work because it was carrying wood. And so the, the, the Sabbath was instructed to give people a right to rest. They, they it was designed to, to be God's good plan of human flourishing, to, to take a break, to be uh, renewed, to be refreshed, to be reminded that we are human beings, we're not human doings, that all of life comes from the hand of God. It was, it was designed to be a good thing for people to grow in their love with God and their relationship with the people around them. That was the intention. And so now Jesus, this upstart teacher from Galilee, has inserted him right, himself right into the middle of Sabbath, and he's taking a provocative and controversial stand. He looks at everybody. He knows what's coming for him. He knows what he's doing, and then he acts. He asks the man to stretch out his hand, and the man's able to respond, indicating that the healing took place. You know, Jesus could have postponed this. He could have waited a different time and different place, just a few hours And he could have spared the controversy. But it seems like he wanted to do it then on purpose. To demonstrate what Sabbath is all about, flourishing of all people, to demonstrate his authority mostly. Jesus, the Son of Man, God's King, God's chosen King, the Messiah for Israel. And you would think that everybody would be happy, right? I mean, what better way, Sabbath, to get to experience God's goodness than to watch a healing, something miraculous, something that no human being can conjure up or do. But rather than rejoicing and being excited about it, people are angry. Angry. The word for anger that that Luke uses is a strong term. It describes an irrational anger, a, a pathological rage. It reveals the hardness of their heart. They didn't want this person healed. They didn't want it on Sabbath. They wanted Jesus to fit in their box. And because Jesus wouldn't fit in their box... Opposition to Jesus continued to rise. And so red lights are going off, alarms, sirens. Hey, we've we've got somebody who's breaking a law here. They're not living right. I don't know what it is about humans. I think part of it may be our quest for for safety and security. Because sometimes if, if we just know we have a checklist or we have a certain set of things we know we do or don't do, it just feels kind of like as hard as it may be, at least that's easier And so humans like to make rules. I was reading about some of them. In in Italy, you can't eat on church steps. Just in case you go to Italy, you can't eat on church steps. In San Francisco, you can't feed the pigeons. Maybe we need to do that here at Abilene and at Pioneer Drive because we've got them everywhere. In Canada, it's illegal to use a piggy bank. Um, A teller, a a person that that works at a desk can refuse payments from excessive amounts of coins. If you've worked in that kind of world, you know. People like to make rules. Rules make us feel safe in many ways. What counts, though, and what you see in the the Scripture, is that the Spirit is that Creator God is honored in what is said and what is done. That's why Jesus asked that important question there in verse 9. Are we going to save life or are we going to destroy it? Will we save life or will we destroy it? You know, Jesus didn't... He just spoke. He had the man stretch out his hand. That was counted and deemed as work by the Pharisees. You see, when, when the Pharisees were condemning Jesus' teaching, they had become so right they were wrong. They had become so right 
They were wrong. They had completely missed the spirit that God intended. As God desires human flourishing, God desires human wholeness. Flourishing with God and neighbor, loving God with with everything we have and loving neighbor. Jesus shows us that God does not intend for us to ignore acting with love and mercy whenever the opportunity exists. We have opportunities before us every day, every day to act with love and mercy. And God doesn't want us ignoring those opportunities. God doesn't want us making rules around why we should or shouldn't help that person, why we should not help that person. Because the law that we've been called to is a higher law. James says this, but if you, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. We've been called up. We've been called to a, to a higher law. To, to How does God's love flow through us And as God's ambassadors, how do we go and how do we share that with the world? You know, Jesus was someone who constantly, he ministered to the down and out. He ministered to the the tax collectors, the hurt, the marginalized. Think about who those people are in your life. The people who are hurt, who are marginalized, who are off in the corner of society or in the corner of churches it might be some kind of uh, folks that uh, maybe some would describe as, well, well the socially undesirables or, or people of some kind of different ethnic makeup or people who dress differently than, than you do or, or people who don't act or, or fit into your socioeconomic category. Uh, the late Timothy Keller writes this about uh, Pharisaism, even in evangelical churches, when he said this, he said, if the preaching of our ministers and the practice of our parishioners do not have the same effect on people that Jesus had, then we must not be declaring the same message that Jesus did. The same people that came to Jesus, the poor, the outcast, the down and out, prisoners, the sick, the blind, the lame, the immigrant, those people better be coming to us. People, people who were hurting, people who were broken, people who didn't fit the mold, loved being around Jesus. They loved it, and they ought to love being around us. Sadly, sometimes that's not true. Jesus practiced a law of love. The Pharisees practiced a law of legalism. What's legalism? Because that's a word that gets thrown around a lot, especially when someone maybe challenges us on something we don't like. Oh, you're just being legalistic. Let's define it, and then let's explain it using the words of Jesus, okay? Legalism. It's over-applying the law to such an extent that people are crushed or ignored. Over-applying, and that word over is an important qualifier, over-applying the law to such an extent that people are crushed or ignored. Because legalists think that rule-keeping is ground for their acceptance with God. There's nothing, there's no amount of rules you can keep to make you any more loved or less loved by God. You can't earn that by your behavior. You don't earn that by your behavior. But but what Jesus demonstrated was that the needs of people are different and and more important than this whole extra biblical religious concoction that the Pharisees had developed. Because what legalists do is they major in the minors and they minor in the majors. Jesus showed how to get it right. Think about it. It wasn't the adulterers, it wasn't the robbers, it wasn't the, uh, the, the folks who were on the margins of society that put Jesus on the cross. It was the legalists. Because at the heart of legalism is pride. It's an attempt to gain favor without regard, with God without re- regard to the condition of our heart. Without regard for the condition of our heart. And without regard for the consequences of our actions. So here's some different things. You see it in in Jesus' teaching. How do we know if we're being a legalist? Well, number one, legalists know know what to say, but they do not do what they say. Jesus said this. He said in Matthew 23, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Closely related, they preach, but they don't practice. They practice their faith for performance, to be seen by other people. Jesus said in verse 5 of Matthew 23, everything they do is done for people to see. 
They do all their deeds to be seen by others. You heard the, the term uh, popularized in the last few years, slacktivism. It's, it, it's great. Uh, let's all let's have a, a big social crisis. We'll change our Facebook cover photo. Man, we've done something about it. We've really uh, spoken to the man, the machine. We've done something. We feel good about it. We buy the bracelet, and then we live our life normally all the other time. We don't have to do anything about it. They preach, but they don't practice. A lot of preaching in our culture from all across the ideological spectrum these days. Number three, legalists keep people from Jesus and his grace. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, get this, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Incredibly strong words. Legalists really aren't interested in seeing people's lives change. They really aren't interested in being near in proximity to people. In fact, those rules are put there to keep a distance between them. Number four, what legalists do is they add their convictions and traditions to the word of God. Woe to you, blind guides, Jesus said. You say if someone swears by the temple, it means nothing, but anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by that oath. You see, the Pharisees had developed this whole system where it went one thing if you swore by the temple, and then, well, the gold of the temple was another thing. And that's why Jesus said, you know, basically cut all this out. All you need to say is yes or no. Anything else comes from the evil one. And there are so many ways. I mean, we are all tempted to do this. And, and, and I'm, I would count myself a, a recovering legalist in, in many ways. But dress, uh, worship style, uh, where we live, our, our beliefs that are, are secondary and clearly secondary issues, beliefs that are not essential, uh, beliefs that are not addressed clearly and consistently in Scripture can all be areas that we, we add on to and we make essential. And the Pharisees had a whole system of this. Legalists lack love for people in need. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. Gives a great word picture. You strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. You see, the Pharisees were were looking for ways out. And they were looking for ways to keep their system that they loved propped up. Every reason to not help the poor, the down and out, the lonely. Jesus gave a parable and basically said, parable of Good Samaritan, you're the kind of people that if you saw someone lying on the side of the road dead, you'd just ignore them. And you'd just move on because you had more important things to do. The final one I would make mention of is what legalists do is they cover sin instead of confessing and repeating. And wow, we're see, I mean, we see this all over our culture in churches as well. And it's sad and it, and it, and it hurts our witness. We don't have to be perfect. We're not going to be perfect. That's why we confess our sin. That's why we're, we tell the truth about who we are. And that's why we thank God for the grace of Jesus. Jesus said this, in the same way on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Hypocrisy and wickedness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. So what ends up happening, legalists do this, and then what what happens is they're against everyone and don't get why everyone seems to be against them. I heard about a bumper sticker that said, they don't hate you because they hated Jesus first. They hate you because you're being a punk. (laughs) Legalists think they're doing Jesus a favor. They think they're doing Jesus a favor. They aren't acting much like him at all. I've been guilty of it. Now, let's talk about the other side of the ditch because we've got to cover both. We can get legalism on one side, What your pastor is not saying today, and I want to be clear, is that anything goes. (laughs) If it's loving, anything goes. That's not what we're saying. Rules, remember, are designed by God because God created us. God knows us. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Rules are designed to help us grow and flourish with God, with self, 
with neighbors. So, so we need to understand the intent. We need to understand the spirit of it. Imagine for a moment you've got a, a great field, and on that field you've got swimming pool, you've got a, a, a baseball diamond, you got a basketball court, you got a football field, you got a playground, you got a splash pad, you got every activity you could ever want. But what just on the edge of each of those fields is a 500 foot chasm. How much fun would you have playing around? I don't like heights, I'd be absolutely terrified. Now you come in and you and you put up a nice fence. And I'm going to be able to run, I'm going to be able to play, I'm going to be able to enjoy my time, I'm going to be able to compete. I'm going to be able to use the field as it was intended. But if I don't have that fence, I'm going to fall off. And you see, that's, that's what rules were, were, were there to do, that, that, that God wants his people to flourish. And there, there is a, a Christian ethic. There is a, a Christian conviction. And we've been called to, to walk in step with the Spirit and, and to walk that way. So to just think that rules are just there meant to be broken, that's not correct. Because rules are, are not meant to keep us from doing the right thing. Rules are ultimately meant to provide true freedom. And that's what the Pharisees missed. They weren't living in any kind of freedom. There are tons of stress, tons of anxiety in that system. You know, our culture has a lot of rule makers today. All sides of the ideological spectrum, by the way, it comes in all shapes and sizes. Rule makers people who want to police everybody else's behavior except their own. What we need is people who walk in love and conviction, embodying the values of the kingdom, loving people really, really well. So how do we know what rules we should break and what rules we should keep? Number one, does breaking the rule violate a clear, consistent teaching of the Bible? Things like lying, cheating, murder, gossip, our sexual ethic, if it's going to violate one of those clear, consistent teachings of Scripture, then you don't break the rule. It's there to help you. It's there to be that fence so that you can play within the bounds that God created you to be. But if the answer to that is no, then we got to think about it. Does this rule crush or neglect someone in need? By breaking this rule, are more people able to see Jesus and discover his grace? And if, if the answer to two and three is yes, then, then break the rule. Then then act the way the Spirit is, is leading you to act. There was a debate in the book of Acts. About what would it look like for the, what would be required of people in the new church, the church as it was being birthed and, and forming? And Peter made this bold statement. He said, we must obey God rather than human beings. We must obey God rather than human beings. And that's why it takes discernment to know time, place, way, how, all those kinds of things. But man-made rules are, are not intended to keep us from doing the right thing. What God desires, what Jesus desires for you and for me is that deep in our hearts there's an inner transformation that changes how we live, how we act, how we express our love to God, and how we express our love to neighbor, and that that compassion would breed righteous acts. And so as, as you go about your week, you think about what you have on your schedule or what God may surprise you with this week, may you be guided by the Holy Spirit to love people really well and to be present wherever you are, to love and to act in accordance with Jesus' law of love. Rules are not meant to keep us from doing the right thing. May we practice the law of our Lord and King Jesus, the law of of love. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today and thank you for giving us your holy scripture to illuminate our path. Lord, we're sorry and we confess that so often we make a mess of things. We, we do things our own way. We try to excuse ourselves, find the loophole out of doing what you've called us to do. Lord, help us to be people. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, skin to feel where you're moving us and where you want us to be going today and the days to come. May our lives be majored in the majors. Forgive us when we major in the minors. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.